Well, today we're going to continue our series uh, on still waters, which comes from the 23rd Psalm. In this Psalm, it says that he leads me beside still waters. And so in still waters, we're talking about the kind of church that God wants us to be. Last week, we talked about this. What kind of church are we going to be? What kind of church does God use? What kind of people do we want to be? And then uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about helping people who are in pain. Now, this is the kind of church that I believe we want to be. How many know, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many know that people in our country and in our culture are in pain. Sometimes you don't see it. Sometimes in our social media era, people will pretend. Anybody know that? Anybody see a picture of somebody and they're like enjoying the beach and it looks so beautiful and you're so jealous and then you find out they were just in the sandbox out behind the school where their kids go to school and they edited those photos. Well, there are people that put up the front. There are people that we would say they put on their Sunday face. You know what the Sunday face is, right? It's where you pretend that everything's okay. The people that are full of smiles in the parking lot and the greeters, they greet you at the door and they say, how are you doing? And you're like, I'm great. And you're lying. You're not great. You want to punch. You almost punched your kids, all right, before you got to church. And, you know, and I'm not condoning punching kids, but I'm just saying that sometimes they deserve it. That's, that's all I'm saying, all right? You know, after 42 times, he won't stop touching me, Daddy. He's on my side. You almost run into a telephone pole trying to blap him upside the head on the way. But a giant halo descends out of heaven over your car when you're tires hit the parking lot and you put on the Sunday face. But all around us, there are people that are hurting. People have experienced loss. Some are in deeper emotional states and uh, mental illness, if you will, uh, from the pandemic, maybe than ever before. There are people all around us that battle hurt Sometimes it's in their marriage or their relationships. Sometimes it's in their finances. Sometimes it's in their health. But what we know is they're hurting people. Now, the good news is that Jesus gave us a ministry model. Do you know what Jesus did? He ministered to hurting people so that they would hear the good news of Jesus. And all around us, we have the opportunity about being able to bring people into still waters. Now, as I told you last week, uh, part of the shepherd's job is to create still waters. If the sheep try to drink from a fast-running stream, their wool will get soaked, it will pull them down, and they will drown. And so part of a shepherd's job is to create waters that are still so that the sheep can drink and be healthy. And, and my job as a pastor, our job as elders and staff and leaders here at Avalon Church, and our job as a church is to create opportunities to still the waters for people. That's why we say things like we embrace the mess. Now, that does not mean that we embrace sin it doesn't mean that we don't teach the truth of the Word of God. In fact, if you do not teach the truth of the Word of God, there is no hope for people. And so we know that the love of God is backed up with the grace of God. And when we as a church are going to do what God has called us to do, we've got to extend the grace of God. We've got to create still waters for people to be able to drink from the water of life. And so that is our job. And the ministry model that Jesus gave is one that we want to follow. We want to minister to hurting people. So let's pick up and read. We're just going to read one verse from Psalm 23 today. We've got other verses that we'll read. But one verse, verse number four. 
Remember, David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So that verse, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In this verse, David talks about God's presence, his comfort, and his activity in times of trouble in our lives. Aren't you glad that God is actively involved in our lives? I know some people have this picture of God that at the very worst, God is the big guy in the sky that wants to whack people upside the head every time they do something wrong. And for them, the best picture of God is that Uh, at the very best of their times, God is completely out of touch. He's completely uninvolved in their lives. If there's problems in their lives, he doesn't get involved. If they have fear in their life, he offers no comfort. He is just uh, standing outside of time and space, and he really does not care for us. Nothing could be further from the truth of the picture that the Bible paints for us about our loving Heavenly Father. He is a God who cares. He is a God who loves. He is a God who knows you and wants to have a relationship with you. Isn't that amazing? There are a lot of powerful, influential people that don't know me. They don't care because they don't know me. They don't want to have a relationship with me because they don't know me. But even... No matter how far you may feel from God, you're not too far because God wants to have a relationship with you. God, our Heavenly Father, cares about you. So I want to just point out to you three things from this one verse that we must do if we're going to be a church that ministers to hurting people, if we're going to help the people around us. Here's the first thing we've got to do. We've got to offer courage. He said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that tells me that people around us are hurting. Did you know that phrase, the valley of the shadow of death? uh, It can mean the valley of deep despair. And there are people all around us. Sometimes they have despair because of their health and they are afraid Their quality of life has been robbed for them. They are afraid about their outlook. They don't know what's going to happen to them. They are in deep despair. There are others that have financial problems, financial burdens, and even though they they work and they try, it just seems like the harder they try, the deeper in debt they get, and the further and further they get away from realizing the dreams that they have in their life. And they are in the valley of deep despair. There are others that deal with emotional and mental health issues and for a variety of reasons, in spite of the fact that they may have many things that other people look in their life and they say, well, you've got a lot to be happy about, people just don't understand. You probably saw on the news that uh, the, the Judd lady of the Judds just died. They said that she had mental illness for many, many years. She suffered with depression And no matter what people would say to her, she could not seem to get out of that depression. And as a a church and as believers, we have a responsibility to minister to people who are in pain, whether it's financial, whether it's health-related, whether it's emotional, whether it's in their relationship, no matter what it is, God has put us here as a light to point people to Jesus Christ. Let me just say this about courage that David, I believe, shows us in this one little sentence, this one little phrase that we read. First thing we note about troubles is that they are temporary. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that shadow, I'm not going to hurt you. It's temporary. It's kind of like a middle school romance. It won't last long. No matter what predicament you find yourself in, There are better days coming. You say, well, I don't know if there are better days coming. If you're a follower of Jesus, there are better days coming. 
God promised that these trials that we go through here are just a little bit of light affliction compared to what God has prepared for us. Trials are temporary. And what that means is I'm just walking through. Yea, though I walk through. I'm just walking through. My freshman year of college, um, I had several different jobs. Um, One of the jobs I got was with a temporary agency, and they would send us to all these different jobs around the city of Jacksonville, and we would uh, go do these jobs for a day or two, and then uh, we'd be finished with that, and then we'd go do something else. And one job that I had, we worked about a week at a meat processing plant. Now, if you've never been a part of that, count yourself lucky, all right? That was one of the most disgusting jobs I've ever seen in my life. I swore off eating hamburgers at fast food joints after I worked at this meat processing plant. Now, what we would do is we would walk in uh, to this plant and th- this, this building, and there would be people there that were feeding uh, this big machine that ground the, the beef up into, into hamburger meat, and they would throw it into this big old bin. Now, and I hate to be gross, but sometimes there'd be bone in there and they'd just grind it right up. And uh, we would walk in and there was a dude standing there with a big old flat shovel, like a snow shovel. And when he'd throw that meat into the grinder, there would be some meat that would just kind of pop out. Like, boom, and it would just kind of jump out. And this dude with his snow shovel would shovel the meat that came out of the, of the hopper and he'd throw it back in. Now, the good news is that the area that we walked through was the area that he was shoveling the extra meat back in. And then this meat would get ground up and they, you remember the, uh, the coin operated washing machines, you put the coins in, you'd slide it in and pull it out. Well, this big hopper of ground burger, ground meat would uh, come and, and these slots basically would punch into the meat and pop it out. And then this thing would hit it and it'd go down on a conveyor belt and it'd go through, I don't know, about a hundred foot uh, long uh, freezer that was extremely, extremely cold. And it would freeze the burgers so hard that you literally, when they came out, you could take them and whack them like that and they would shatter, okay? I've never seen a hamburger shatter before, but this did. And so, and this was back in the early 80s, okay? Uh, You know, HIV and all this stuff was not yet a concern. And we would go in and uh, we had the option to wear gloves or not. Now, our job was that once that hamburger, that frozen plate of a burger uh, came out, our job was to pick it up and to pick out any pieces of bone or rock or dirt or whatever else, because we walked through that area, whatever else was in there, our job, and people would cut their fingers and they'd say a few choice words, and then they'd throw that burger with the blood on it right in the hopper with everything else. Now, what I'm saying is, if you eat a hamburger at a fast food restaurant, you're an idiot, all right? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but here's what I know about that job. And I'm glad I didn't have that job for very long. It was a temporary job. And you know what we did with that job? We could say, just like David, I'm just walking through. I was there for just a little time, just walking through. It was temporary. Now, here's what the Bible tells us about our troubles. We're just walking through them. It's not permanent. You you may feel like that you have no hope. You may feel like there is no end end in sight. You may feel like that there is no light at the end of the tunnel, but I'm telling you, the Bible is very clear. You're just walking through the valley of the shadow of death. It's temporary. 
Here's the second thing uh, I want you to see, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17. So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us. You ever been there? On the inside where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times, the lavish celebration prepared for us. You know what God says about your problems? They're just temporary. Here's the second thing. They're powerless. He said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Anybody ever been punched by a shadow? I'm not going to ask if anybody's ever been scared by a shadow because you can be scared by a shadow. Somebody walks up and you're not expecting them, it causes you to jump. My wife is an expert at this. Um, I can be walking through the house. I'll walk into a room. I'm not trying to be quiet. I'm not trying to sneak up on her, but evidently she's concentrating on something else. And I walk into a room and she'll be like, oh, you scared me. You know, a, the shadow of death is kind of like that. It may sneak up on you. You may not be expecting it, but in the end, all it is is a shadow. And shadows are powerless. People are going to face darkness through loss and depression and addiction and codependency. But thank God, no matter what problems you face, they're temporary. And no matter what it is, it's powerless when you turn to God. When you turn to Jesus, he has the power over the shadow of death. Thank God. John 16, 33, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. This is Jesus talking. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. Aren't you glad that Jesus says, whatever you're facing, I've already defeated it. You don't need to worry about it. You don't need to be afraid of it. Why? It's just the valley of the shadow of death. It's temporary. It's powerless. And then... The thing with all problems and trials, you know what? They have a purpose. They do have a purpose. God doesn't let us go through problems without a purpose. He said, I will fear no evil. Um, I love what it says in Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, I want you to notice that the Bible does not say that all things are good. It says, for those that love God, all things will work together for good. So no one's saying that your pain is good. But God does say that even though you do experience pain in this life, if you'll trust me, I will work on your behalf And I will work it together for good. And so we can trust God. You see, God is with us in our troubles. It doesn't mean that he delivers us from our troubles. Notice David said, I'm going to walk through. I'm going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You really can't avoid that. In life, there are going to be problems. In life, there are going to be troubles. In life, there are going to be trials. Every one of us walks through those problems. If you're not in a trial right now, just hold on. One's going to come. But God says he's with us. And it's not that he will deliver us from them, though he does have the power to do that if he chooses. But remember, there's a purpose. He can turn our fears into faith. Do you know that God has a reason that he does not deliver us from some of our troubles is because when we go through them, he wants us to be closer to him. He wants us to grow. Did you know that it is impossible for you to get to be a champion athlete of any kind? We just had the NFL draft this past week. Now, there are a lot of young men whose dream is to play in the NFL, 
And most of us, we like watching football on Sundays or whenever. And the truth is, every one of these guys that is going to play on Sundays, they have been through unlimited, often nearly unbearable trials, physically. If you ever played football, just saying the phrase two-a-days can cause you to get PTSD. Man, you think about the two-a-days, you think about when you had to do all of that training, and man, the fact is, it was very painful. It was trying But the fact is, you don't get better. You don't get to realize your dream unless you go through some trials. And the same way what God wants for you and me is to realize that he has a purpose for our pain. And it's going to make us better. And as a result, you'll be able to minister to other people. We've got to offer courage as a church. Here's the second thing we've got to offer. We've got to offer community. Community is about the church. He said, and I love this, he said, I I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Whenever we get community with God, that's fellowship with God. Do you know that the main way, it's not that you can't have times of worship. You should. I hope when you read the Bible that you don't just scratch your head and think, man, what does that mean? I hope there are times that God speaks to you. During your time of prayer, I hope you feel close to God. Uh, During your time during the week, you listen to worship music. I think that's awesome, okay? Uh, It can certainly make you feel close to God. But there is nothing that takes place of a community of believers. One thing to offer courage is another thing to offer a home. You see, that's what God is calling us to do. It is the number one way in the Bible to have a close relationship with God. It's through the church. Does that mean that going to church is all you need? No. Does that mean that everybody that goes to church is perfect? Look around. No. Of course it doesn't mean that. That's why we adopted the phrase, Avalon Church is the perfect place for imperfect people. The person next to you, they're not perfect, and neither are you. But the fact is, it's not about perfection, but it's about community. It's about encouragement. It's about lifting each other up. It's about support. And that is how, as a church, we can make a difference in the lives of people. God has called us to offer community. Now, my desire for you is that you discover what that means. You see, coming to church is not just about saying, boy, that was a good message today. I learned not to, and I appreciate when you say that, trust me, I really appreciate it. But I also know that not everybody that says it really means it. I've had, this has happened to me more than once, on a Sunday that I did not preach. People come up to me afterwards to shake my hand and say, boy, that was a great message today, Pastor. And I didn't even preach. And I'm like, what are you saying? What are you saying? Look, it's not about how good the sermon was. It's not about how beautiful the music was. And I believe that we got to do offer that, feed people and, and so forth and engage people. It's not about the programming. But when you truly experience what the church is designed to be, it's about community. It's about belonging. It's about connecting. Every one of us desires that in our life. And yet, not everybody has it. And I feel sorry for people that think that the church is, they're like, well, I can worship God out on the golf course just like you can in church. And that's true. You can. I mean, I can't because I cuss too much when I play golf because I, you know, I know I shouldn't, but there are things that I'm like, I can't believe I hit that shot. Um, I haven't played golf in a long time. All right. So, um, and I'm going to quit talking about this because y'all are starting to judge me because I said I would cuss. All right. Let me rewind that. Um, I can't play golf because it frustrates me. All right, there we go. That's better. We'll edit that part out. But here's the point. You know, you can worship God anywhere you are, but church is not just about worship. It's about connecting. 
It's about community. And you know what God calls us to do as a church? To offer hope to people. Now I realize that not everybody's going to connect at the same level. I get that. I wish everybody would connect deeply, but not everybody's going to do that. Some people are just not going to do it. I'm, I'm okay. Look, if you come here, I'm just glad you come. I want you to connect. I want you to grow, okay? But I'm glad that you come. But here's the point. God calls us to offer community as a church. And that's what this is about. And then finally, here's the last thing. God has called us to offer comfort. We've got to give courage to people, to give them hope. We've got to offer community as a church, but we also need to offer comfort. He said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod was for the enemy, the wolves, the ones that were attacking the sheep. The staff, you know what that was for? That was for the sheep. Now, he didn't whack them upside the head, but the shepherd's staff, you know what, had a little crook in it. And whenever the sheep would stray, you know what he would do? In a loving way, he just pulled that sheep right back to the flock. And you know what God calls us to do? To understand that he is the one that brings comfort to us. Sometimes he offers comfort by whacking our enemies upside the head. Making sure that we understand that he is in control. He is powerful and nothing can overwhelm us. And then there are other times he offers us comfort by being there with us, by pulling us close to his heart. And what God has called us to do is to make sure that we offer comfort to those in need. Matthew 4, 16, the people who live in darkness will see a great light. On those who live in the dark land of death, the light will shine. Now I want to just take a minute as I close to challenge you. I'm calling our church to a higher and greater level of commitment. I'm so excited about our days ahead. I believe our best days are ahead of us. I believe God is going to do an incredible thing through this group of people and that we're going to see many, many more connected and and we're just going to really see what God does and it's going to be great. But I believe that nothing great happens without a greater level of commitment. Now, people need us. We must not be apathetic. We must step up. I believe that our greatest opportunities lie ahead of us. They're not behind us. They're in front of us. But if we're going to be a church of the status quo, we might as well hang it up right now. God has not called us to be that. He has called us to be the kind of church that God uses. He has called us to step up and to help people who are hurting. Now, I just want to offer just a couple of challenges. And I am not suggesting that when I say these things that we're starting this. Uh, The fact is, we might. Uh, The fact is, we won't unless somebody becomes the champion of some of these ideas. Somebody says, you know what, I feel called to that. I feel called uh, to, to do this. We, we have said before, we will build the church with or without facilities. The fact is, God has called us to a church, as a church to minister to hurting people. Now, there are a few ways that people suffer most in our culture. They suffer in their finances. Some suffer in their relationships through divorce or other turmoil in their relationships. Others have addictions. And as a church, we have the answer. Here's what I want to do. I want to call our church to a greater level of inviting and serving. Everybody can do that. Everybody can invite somebody. Everybody can talk about what God is doing in your life. You don't have to be Billy Graham to do that. You don't have to have a seminary degree to do that. But everybody can invite and serve. Now, I'm not asking single, uh, you know, individual people to do everything. That doesn't work. But I am asking everybody to do something. I'm asking everybody to get involved. Now, there are three challenges that I want to offer to you today for us as a church to step up in another level of ministering to our community.
Once again, it's not about the people that are inside these walls or the people that are watching online. It's about those who are not here yet. You see, if it's just about us, well, we might as well just be a country club and charge memberships. But it's not just about us. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So one of the biggest ways that people suffer is through finances. Now, here's what I'm going to throw out. We're already starting this, okay? We have a couple in our church that is doing Dave Ramsey, and they're helping people. They're already inviting people outside of our church to come and be a part of this group. I believe as a church, now we've done this before, so it's not like I'm asking people to do something that hasn't been done in the past. We are, as a church, going to offer once, maybe twice a year, financial resources for people that are hurting in the community. You say, what, is that? what do you mean by that? We'll have a Saturday or something of this nature. I'm not, I'm not the gifted organizer, okay? I'm just throwing out ideas. I'm throwing out challenges. And what I'm saying is this. You know what we need? We need some people that will say, you know what? I'm going to be a champion for that. I'm going to help with that. I want to be a part of that, okay? And uh, so that's one way to be involved. And you can be a part of that if you'd like. Another way is offering relationship hope. Now, once again, this is something we've done before, and I know that it's not that hard for us to do. But you know what we need to do as a church? We need to offer hope for people in their marriage or hope for people that are not in a marriage and they're having difficulty in their relationship. We need to offer them hope. And one thing, though, now, you know, we're not a counseling service. I'm not suggesting we are. But you know what we can do? We can have four, five, six couples, maybe more. I don't know. They'll say, you know what I'll do? Once a month, I will counsel. Not that you need a degree in counseling. Not that you need to be a PhD. But if you've been married for a little while, you know what you've got? You've got some experience. And you've got something to offer somebody that's struggling in their, in their marriage. So maybe you would say, you know what I will do? I'll, uh, I'll offer some hope. And once a month, I'll, whoever signs me up, I'm, you won't be the one that organizes it, okay? But uh, somebody that says, hey, I want some counseling, then maybe you'd be a couple that would say, you know what? I can talk with people. And, and you talk with them that one time, and that's it. You don't have to keep on. Uh, it's not like you're entering into a counseling relationship. But you know what we're doing by doing that? We're offering hope to the community. We're offering hope to those that need it in finances. We're offering hope to those that need it in their relationships. And I believe one of the greatest struggles in our community right now is addiction. We have people that need deliverance. We, need, we have people that need hope, addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs, addicted to whatever. And I'm not, once again, I am not saying that we're doing this. I'm saying we need to do this. I am not saying I am organizing it because I am not. If I'm the only one that comes up with ideas, if I'm the only one that comes up with a strategy, if I'm the only one that leads something, we are in trouble because I'm not that good at it. But I'm saying this. We have people in this room that God is speaking to you right now that you can be one of the ones that will offer hope to people that are addicted. There's a program called Celebrate Recovery. I'm not even saying that's what we're going to use. It might be, but I know over the past two years of the pandemic, there have been a lot of people that needed that, that haven't had that, and as a result, they've been addicted to drugs, opiates, opioids, whatever you call it. And you know what we need? We need some champions. So people that will say, you know what I'm going to do? I don't know if I can lead it. I don't know if I've got the organizational skills to organize it. But I believe that God's calling me to do something. And, and, and maybe, you know, they meet one night a week or whatever. Maybe you'll be a part of that. Maybe you know people in our church that are struggling with addictions themselves. And so what am I saying? I'm saying that we need some champions. And I'm saying that God has called us as a church to help people who are hurting. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us help others. Help us help the hurting. 
God, I pray that you just help our church, God. Help us to do what you have called us to do. Help us to be light in the community so that others can come to know you. Before I finish my prayer, those of you online or those of you in the room, maybe you'll join the people that today, you know what, they, they express publicly that they've trusted Christ. Maybe you'd say, Pastor, I'd like to be saved today. You can pray a simple prayer, something like this. Dear God, I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins and rose from the grave. And I'm asking you right now to come into my life and to save me, to change me. God promises if you'll ask that, he'll do it. Those of you online, fill out at the bottom of the screen. You can click that you pray to receive Christ. Those of you in the room, fill out a next step card, the blue next step card, and bring it to our prayer team. Our prayer team is going to be up here at the front to pray with anybody that would like to have prayer. And it could be about anything. It could be about finances. It could be about your health. It could be about your job, your relationship, your kids. It doesn't matter what it is. You can come and pray, and um, these prayer leaders will help you. Okay, they'll pray with you. But I, I, maybe you would say, you know, Pastor, this is, uh, this is what I need. I need salvation today. Or, and this is a challenge. This is the final challenge. I wonder if God spoke to you online, in the room, about being a champion for somebody, about helping those that are hurting. I'm going to ask you to take a next step card, put your name on it. And then if you feel that God is saying, you know what, I want to help with finances. And by that, we don't mean that you're going to give out money. But maybe you'd be interested in, in being a part of the occasional seminar that will help people get out of debt or manage their money. Or maybe you'd say, Pastor, you know what? My wife and I, we don't, we're not experts, but we've been married. And maybe we can be one of those that would say, you know what? I'll help. If there's somebody who wants to be talked to, we can just, as a couple that has been down the road a little further than them, we'll help them. I want you to take that card, put your name on it, and put marriage. If you're interested in the finance part, put your name on it and put finances. And then the last one, I just want you to put your name on it. The, those that are addicted and you'd like, maybe you're interested. We don't even have anything to uh, organize or to do. I'm just saying, if you're interested, if God has spoken to you about this, you take that card, put your name on it, and at the bottom, put addiction. We'll know what that means. And uh, maybe you're interested in helping. You may not be saying, I'm going to be the one that will lead it. I may not be the one that will organize it, but I'm interested in helping in some way. Or I'm interested in attending something like that. You put your name on that, and uh, we'll know how to respond. Whatever your next step is, I hope you'll take it today. Uh, put on the card, the next step card. If you're new to Avalon, fill it out. Uh, bring it to one of our prayer team members or drop it in the drop box on the way out. And we're so glad that you've been a part of our service today. Father, bless us as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget, we have prayer tomorrow morning at 6.30 for anybody that would like to come. Don't have to be here the whole time. Maybe on your way to work, you'll drop in and pray. Um, and don't forget that our prayer team is up here at the front afterwards. God bless you. I love you. I'll see you next week. Have a great week. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.